Okay, so we're starting again. Uh, this is the Cranberry Glaze Botanical Area. <laughs> um, it's a high elevation bog, uh, which seems very out of place in West Virginia. It looks very similar to the muskegs of northern areas in Canada. It's located in Pocahontas County, um, West Virginia, which is part of the Monongahela National Forest, which is the forest that I work for. It's the largest area of bogs in West Virginia at 750 acres. It's about three miles long and about three fourths of a mile wide. It consists of a bog forest, which are these textured areas here that you can see. And then it has four bogs, which we also call glades, which are round, flag, long, and big glade. Big glade is the most unchanged of the bogs. And you'll find some plants there that you won't find in some of the other um, areas in the glades. There is a half mile loop boardwalk, which you can see here, that'll give visitors access to um, two of the glades, which is round and flag, and some of the um, bog forest as well. The yellow that you're looking at, this is cow pasture trail, and it travels the perimeter of the Cranberry Glades Botanical Area, which is also protected. So you actually have to have a permit to be anywhere off the boardwalk. And that's mostly because it's a very fragile ecosystem and it's extremely easy for us to destroy it. You can also be fined when you leave the boardwalk because every time we step off, we compact areas, kill plants that took years to grow there and they're never come back. There's several places um, of interesting plants that they only grow in one or, or two locations along the boardwalk. So it wouldn't take much for us to be able to wipe them completely out. So what is a bog? Bogs are a type of wetland. Uh, the ground is usually very spongy, consists largely of decayed plant material, um, which we call peat, and they have very acidic waters um, that are covered in thick carpets of uh, spigna moss. And most of the moisture that they're going to get is going to come from rain and snow melt. And then they're also very nutrient poor. Even though the glades contains lots of water, um, sometimes if you visit, it's extremely hard to, to see it. And it's because there's a plant called sphagnum moss, which you can see here. It is holding all that water. It's the most common moss of the glades and forms very thick mats. And these layers of moss and peat give the glades that sponginess. And in some areas, it's almost kind of a bounciness as well. In the upper corner, this is one single sphagnum moss plant, and it can hold 20 to 30 times its own dry weight in water. So that's kind of like each of us trying to hold 20 more of ourselves. So that's a lot of hidden water. Because of all that water in the glades, many plants don't like to get their tree roots very deep, uh, which you can see here. So when we get high winds, um, bigger plants like trees completely uproot. And you can see just absolutely how shallow the root system is. Um, but don't worry, this isn't the end of the story for the tree. The depressions that are left um, hold water. And a lot of amphibians will take advantage of these and lay eggs in the spring. Now that uh, the tree roots are up out of the ground, things like birds and snakes uh, nest in the root bowl. And the trunk will eventually become what's called a nursery log or parent tree. Um, it will provide seedlings and other plants a place out of the water. And as the trunk breaks down, these plants will use the nutrients uh, to continue to grow. And eventually, a lot of those will get big enough, it'll start the process all over again. In the early history of the glades, um, glaciers were creeping across the northern part of the continent, and life spread southward with the changing climate conditions in order to survive. While the glaciers never actually made it this far, several species uh, ended their journey in the glades, which is now the southernmost point where they can be found. And one of those plants is the bog rosemary. It's an evergreen little plant. Uh, it has a small bell-shaped white kind of pink flower. Um, if you've ever smelled like rosemary that your parents cook with, this is a little similar, but it does not have that nice um, rich rosemary smell to it. The other one is oblong fruited service berry. And as the name suggests, the berry isn't perfectly round like our common service berries that we have. Uh, this one is, is much longer 
And the flowers are also different. Uh, with our oblong fruited service berries, we have more round petals and our common service berries that you see throughout the state have very long linear uh, petals to the flower. So how do you guys think the Cranberry Glades got its name? If you guessed because it has cranberries, you'd be completely right. There are actually two types of cranberry plants in the glades. We have a large and a small. And instead of a high bush, these are, um, growing on a vine and they're all over the big openings in the glades. Their blooms starting around in June and the berries start ripening sometime in uh, September. Uh, very early on before the glades was actually protected, people used to trudge through um, all the water and spying the moss uh, to collect berries for Thanksgiving. Um, now that it is a national natural landmark and protected, the wildlife get the benefit of all the fruits, um, but you can still see them from the boardwalk. Certain times of the year, like summer, it's a little harder to see the vines because there are other vines and briars and, and vegetation that grows on top of them. But right around November, very late in the season, the uh, plant material has um, died back and exposes all the cranberry vines. So it'll turn this beautiful maroon color. So all that kind of that reddish maroon, that's all cranberry vines that you're seeing. Two of the more intriguing plants that the glades have are carnivorous plants. You've probably heard of a carnivore, which is a small or it, which is an animal that feeds on flesh like mountain lions or wolves do. But instead of a nice steak, carnivorous plants in our area like insects. Uh, carnivorous plants have adapted to grow in places where the soil is thin or has poor nutrients like the bogs. They get the most of their nutrients from trapping and consuming animals and protozoans, usually insects and arthropods. Some tropical versions are big enough that they actually eat mice, but all of our guys here like insects. The biggest one we have in the glades is the purple pitcher plant. They have a modified leaf that kind of balloons out and acts like a, pic a pitcher collecting the rainwater. The upper lip, has stiff hairs that point into the cup. So as the insect is attracted to it, it gets on those hairs and helps slide down into the pitcher, but then the hairs kind of help prevent them from getting out. At that point, the plant produces an enzyme that acts a lot like what our stomach acid does for us to break food down. But at this, in the instance of the plant, they're breaking insects down and then they're absorbing all the nutrients from them. They do get a maroon flowers, but they'll be very high on long stalks above the actual pitchers because pitcher plants don't actually want to end up eating their pollinators. The most fun part about the pitcher plants is when you get to look in them and see what they've got trapped in their water. This one has ants, which are these um, black kind of pieces in the background. And then the little things that are still swimming around, these are little teeny springtails that will eventually uh, drown and be absorbed. Once a pitcher plant dies, you can actually look in the end of it and see like a little graveyard of things that couldn't digest, like snail shells and beetle shells. The other carnivorous plant we have is called the round leaf sundew. The sundew in the glades isn't as big and beautiful like some of those ones you see um, in stores that you can buy. This guy is very small. In fact, the whole plant can fit on a 50 cent piece, which is just a little bit bigger than a quarter. Uh, so you really have to watch for them as you go around the glades. Each plant has a whorl of these spoon shaped uh, leaves with little sticky covered hairs at the end. Each one of those hairs um, is like a sweet nectar, which also gives it that dewy look to it. Um, and it attracts the insects. In the case of our sundews, it's mostly going to be ants. So the ant comes up, thinks he's got some really great reward, takes a bite, and then he gets stuck. And so he starts struggling. And the more he struggles to get away, the more covered he becomes. And eventually he drowns. The sundew will then absorb the nutrients of the ant as it breaks down. This one also gets a uh, little white flower, which is still on a very long stalk well above um, the leaves. Aside from cranberries and carnivorous plants, the glades is known mostly for its orchids. 
Uh, orchids are a special kind of plant that has a seed that is so very small that they don't have the nutrients they need to start growing on their own. So they require a type of fungus in the ground called mycorrhizal to bond with them and then help provide that orchid seed with the nutrients it needs to grow. The right fungus and growing conditions aren't located everywhere. So seeing an orchid is a pretty good treat. Uh, we're lucky at the glades. We have about nine species that you can see just from the boardwalk alone. And there are several more uh, in the area that you can see. There's first one up in very early spring and is also very uncommon is the northern core root, which is very small. It has no leaves. And when it first comes up, it just looks like a little green um, twig popping out of the ground. It has one that is very similar to it. Um, this one will get about a foot tall though. Um, and it will have purple dots on the lower lip. Some of the orchids that we have are very showy and large, like the purple fringed here or the ragged fringed. These guys can get over two foot tall and have very large heads of um, flowers. The rose begonia, on the other hand, will only ever have one flower for each uh, plant, and it's also very short. The grass pink orchid has multiple pink flowers, which is how you can kind of tell those two apart. And these two orchids on a very good year, um, there can be hundreds of them. So some of those open glades will have a pink tinge to them. They're the most abundant orchid we actually have in the glades. These four here that you're looking at actually all bloom about the same time at the end of June or somewhere around 4th of July weekend also if it's a late year. We do have two orchids that are actually fairly new to the glades. The pink lady slipper, which has an inflated little pouch that the bees have to crawl through a slit right here um, in order to pollinate the flower. And then the nodding ladies tresses, which has literally just shown up in the last couple of years um, around the boardwalk. Um, it was originally thought that the way the flowers wrapped the stem looked like a braid of a lady's hair or a tress, uh, and that's how they got their name. One of the things you'll notice when visiting the glades um, is it has some interesting smells every once in a while, and some of those are actually coming from plants. Like the name suggests, skunk cabbage, um, it has very large cabbage-like leaves. And when they're crushed, they emit an odor that just smells like a skunk. It's actually one of the first uh, green nutritious plants up in the spring. So a lot of bears that are in the area will come in and, and eat the leaves. And then they leave us little scat presents along the boardwalk. It has a very odd flower. Um, they actually, each one of these is a little flower and they have no petals. And then they are hid in this kind of modified uh, hooded leaf. They're one of the first flowers up in spring, so much so that they are often still um, surrounded by snow. And in that um, early springtime, there's a couple weeks when the plant can actually produce heat. Um, enough heat that it'll actually melt the snow off from around themselves. They've done some studies and they have concluded that they can reach about 70 degrees inside that little hooded leaflet. So if there's any insects that had come out very early um, in the season, sometimes it'll take uh, refuge um, to stay warm inside the leaf. If you visited the glades during the fall, you may notice a very stinky wet dog, sweaty sock smell that's not very pleasant. The culprit is wild raisin, and the smell is produced as the leaves break down in the fall. Despite the smell, the fruits are edible. Uh, when they're ripe, they turn a blue-black and they shrivel and look just like the raisins that you often get during your lunch. There are some plants, however, that do smell out pretty good. Um, spice bush is one of them. The, uh, when the leaves are crushed, they have a, a very citrusy kind of spicy smell. In the spring, I think it's more citrusy, and as the, the leaf ages into fall, um, it gets a little spicier smelling to me. Um, they do get a bloom very early in the season. Uh, it's kind of a yellow-green color, and it will develop a bright red fruit later in the year. The show-stopping bright red flower of scarlet bee balm um, 
when crushed or brushed against, it emits a smell and it's somewhere between kind of a mint and an oregano. It is preferred by hummingbirds, um, specifically the ruby-throated hummingbird. So when it's in full bloom, we will actually lose most of the hummingbirds at our nature center because they prefer this one and they will not come back until it actually stops producing nectar. Several species of fern can be found in the glades. Uh, with ferns, um, instead of leaves, they have what's called a frond. And instead of seeds, they have spores. So on these ones, each one of these green that looks like a leaf, this is called a frond. And the best known one in the glades is called the cinnamon fern, which gets its name for the cinnamon collared fertile frond. And a fertile frond is a leaflet on it that is strictly for um, producing seeds, or in this case, the spores. And some people also think that when it's fully matured, that it kind of looks a little bit like a cinnamon stick. In the glades, because there's all the, the, the water, they can actually reach, um, reach about five feet, uh, which gives the glades a very uh, Jurassic kind of look to them. When they first come up, they're um, covered in fuzz and they're in tight little curls. And they're called fiddleheads at this point because uh, along the way, someone thought they looked like the carved head of a fiddle. If there are hummingbirds in the area um, that are going to nest kind of around the glades, uh, some of them will actually collect this fuzz um, to line their nest with. The easiest of all the ferns in the glades to ID are the sensitive ferns, as they have a very unique shaped frond. They're name sensitive because the first frost um, start killing them back um, and they will disappear until next spring. Even though the fronds are gone, they can still be ID'd though. Uh, the fertile frond um, looks a bit like a wand with a whole bunch of beads attached to it. And you can see them here. Um, in the spring, uh, when it, we start getting the warm rains, they're actually bust open and the spores will come out. If you're in the glades at the end of summer and in the fall, you'll see these white cottony balls in the openings. And I'm betting you can guess what the name of them are. They're called cotton grass. The bits of the fluff, uh, cottony fluffy seed um, will catch wind and blow around, which will transport all the seeds to other places, um, which is why you see so many cotton grasses um, in the glades. The glades area does have a few unusual flowers, um, and some of them kind of look like they're in bud all the time. The flowers have a very small opening at the end, um, like this bottle gentian, um, that forces bumblebees to have to fight their way into the flowers um, to act across the pollen to access their nectar reward at the very back of it. Uh, by doing this, the flower makes sure that the pollen is attached to the bee and then transported to another flower. But often, all you can see is a tiny little bee butt sticking out of the end of a flower as they fight their way in for the nectar. The peculiar looking flower of the turtle head got its name because they thought that the flower resembled that um, of a turtle. Um, this is another plant that likes to make the bees work for the reward and they have to force their way through the, the mouth of the flower. However, some bees have figured out that there's an easy, it's easier to chew a hole in the back of um, these type of flowers to get to the nectar than to crawl through the front of the flower, uh, especially if it's a little bee. Um, that might not be strong enough to force its way in, uh, like the one here. Uh, but not going through the opening of the flower, though, it means the pollen isn't gathered and transported to other uh, flowers. The glaze is more than just plants, though. There are several interesting critters to be found as well. Uh, it is tempting to walk really fast around the boardwalk, um, but many of these creatures you're only going to find by slowing down and taking your time. Uh, like this brightly colored orb weaver spider, uh, they are often hid in curled leaves outside of their web. Uh, this one that you can see here has just packed him a little snack for later. Some insects are very well camouflaged. Uh, like this metallic wood boar beetle. 
um, that is blending with, in with the bark. And even when they're brightly colored like the elderberry borer or the fritillary, um, when they're not moving, they can be a little hard to spot. Um, an array of caterpillars can be found um, if you take the time to flip over a few leaves. Uh, usually around August, we have quite a few. And then we have some insects that are almost alien looking, um, like these tree hoppers, whose nymph stages can look very different uh, from their adults. Uh, this one in particular, the oak tree hopper, this is the nymphs, and they will eventually look like the adult here. Uh, we also have the two marked tree hopper, and they have a tendency to blend in because they look a little like a thorn or the broken end of a twig. All the white spots that you see here along the stem. These are actually their eggs that have recently been laid, and you will actually find these um, in the glaze a lot more and easier than you'll find the adult tree hopper. There are no poisonous snakes in the glades, but we do have a few interesting ones. Uh, we have water snakes, garter snakes, red bellies, and if you're very lucky, uh, the beautiful smooth green snake, um, which are getting a little bit harder to find in our area. It's very common to find snakes stretched out on the boardwalk, sunning themselves to get warm like this garter. Uh, but usually as you get close, they disappear off into the, the vegetation. With all the water in the glades comes amphibians. You might not always be able to see which one just disappeared under the boardwalk or into the water, but most likely it's going to be a green frog or a wood frog. And they're pretty easy to tell apart. Green frogs have various colors of green on them, and they have these very large eardrums. And the wood frogs, they're usually um, kind of tan, the cream color, but their most notable feature is they have a, a mask, which you can see here, it's always right beside their eye. And every once in a while, they can be a brighter color like this one um, during their mating season. There is one salamander, um, which is actually pretty common in our area, uh, but they're very, um, they like to hide a lot. Um, so they usually only come out in the spring when they look to find a mate and lay eggs. And that's the splendid salamander. And they're actually pretty big for salamanders. These guys can get a whole whopping eight inches long. In the spring, you'll find their egg masses um, in still areas of the water. Uh, if they are white and kind of milky like this one here, uh, they belong to the spotted salamander. And if they're clear masses of eggs that are kind of stuck to vegetation, uh, they're most likely the wood frog eggs. Several mammals also call the glades home. Uh, everything from black bears who like to eat the skunk cabbage, otters looking for fish and crawdads, to pine squirrels, which are also known as fairy diddles. They can often be heard barking or chitter chattering along the boardwalk. All the way down to the little teeny voles and shrews um, that you catch glimpses of as they slip across the boardwalk or under the vegetation. There are a few very elusive ones like the bobcat uh, that one can usually just catch glimpses of as they slip back into the brush. Um, if you guys can see this one here, he was not thrilled about running into me so he was disappearing. Uh, his head is right here as he looks back at me. Our most helpful mammal though, um, that we have in the glades is the beaver. Um, even though he cuts a few of our trees down, uh, everywhere that he builds a dam helps hold more water in the glades, which allows us to keep the glades longer. Um, over the years, it's been uh, slowly getting drier uh, because we're getting less rain and less snow accumulation. When this one moved in and created the nice pond area that you're looking at here, um, it allowed fish to thrive, brought the kingfishers, herrings, ducks that now nest there, and a variety of uh, dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, the beaver pond is pretty low in this picture because he wasn't actually active in the area um, this year, um, but this whole area beside the boardwalk will actually be flooded when they are active, um, so much so that we've actually had to raise the boardwalk because he kept flooding it on us. There is definitely no shortage of songbirds in the glades, um, and early mornings are alive with their songs as they call for mates and declare territory. Uh, many are brightly colored, uh, like blue jays and a variety of warblers. While some take a very keen eye, like this woodcock, um, to 
that is perfectly camouflaged and they avoid moving as much as possible so they don't draw any attention. There are a lot of dead trees in the glades because of all the water and several um, hawk species and owl species um, like to take advantage of um, these um, dead snags to be able to hunt from them. Um, I've even seen um, golden eagles hunting in the glades. The Cranberry Glades is one of those places that one should visit more than just once. Um, I recommend visiting at least once each season. Um, it changes so much. Um, so every time you show up, um, the Glades is gonna offer you something different. Um, you And I've merely touched the surface of what you could potentially see or find there. Um, I hope it sparked your curiosity and that you'll come and have your own adventure at the Cranberry Glades Boardwalk. Uh, you never know what you might see. You might even see me crawling around uh, looking for small plants and insects. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you, Rosanna. That was amazing. And please do ask chat questions if you have them, folks who are here right now. Um, I just, I'm amazed that you got a photo of a bobcat. I've seen a bobcat a couple times in my life, but I can't even imagine being ready to take a photo of a bob, bobcat. So that was amazing. A lot of you. Yeah, that was pure luck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to say for the benefit of the folks who are here that um, when you mentioned that the hummingbirds uh, would be all over the scarlet bee bomb, if you do visit the Cranberry Visitor Center, they've got this a uh, hummingbird uh, kind of um, viewing spot, the nectary sort of area. That's really awesome to, to see when they're visiting. You can get pretty close to them. Yeah, in a good year, um, it's nothing to have like a hundred hummingbirds or more. They just kind of buzz around like a swarm of bees out there. <laughs> I had some questions and I'm, I'm gonna go right into them if uh, nobody's chatting them. Uh, I, I was interested to hear you say that the nodding ladies tresses had just showed up there and I'm not somebody who knows the orchids really well, but I know that we have them down in Monroe County, pretty low elevation. And um, I was curious what you, uh, how that, how it showed up. How do you believe it showed up there? It's hard to tell. The seeds are small enough that Wayne could even carry them. Um, mm. The nodding ladies tresses in the fall, they're pretty common in our area. So it's even very likely that um, another critter, um, like a bear or something like that, um, was by one and transported the seeds even. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's but these ones where they particularly showed up are right beside where the bear likes to come off the boardwalk and go back into the glades. <laughs> um, I had a question and I feel like I should know this already, but about the carnivorous plants. And I have seen the pitcher plants. I can't say that I paid, I've paid i paid enough attention to see the sundews at the glades, but are carnivorous plants, are those carnivorous plants photosynthetic? Yes, they do photosynthesize, but the bulk of um, their, their nutrients are coming from um, the insects that they're getting. Okay. I also wondered about the sundew in particular, because, you know, uh, we work with honeybees and other pollinators too, and um, it just amazed me that the sundew is producing so much of the reward for what it could catch, uh, that there's so much nectar. I mean, that's a lot of uh, resources it's using, it seems to me, but do you know how much they can catch in a day or how often they'll actually catch something? Um, I've gone through there, um, and every once in a while you see an ant in there, um, but also that, that sticky nectar it doesn't really run off of it. So once it's on the end of the hair, it, it's kind of there until something mm. like an ant brushes it and causes it to come off. So I'm not okay. sure how long it would take a sundew to actually uh, produce another dew drop. Um, but yeah, every once in a while you see some ants that have traveled through, but not very often like you think you would. Okay, I was, <laughs> that, that's interesting. Uh, Deborah said, thank you very much for an interesting talk and a lovely glimpse into a beautiful place, which is great to hear. Um, I'll ask another question just because <laughs> I'm, I'm here. The, I don't know that I've ever um, paid attention to the different glades at Cranberry Glades. And you had mentioned that the big glade was the most unchanged. And um, 
Could you say something about that? Like how have the glades been changed? What accounts for those changes in some of the glades more than others? Uh, well, some of it is um, succession taking over. Um, and you'll see that uh, a lot um, around the boardwalk, um, like Round Glade. That whole area used to be very open. And now when you look out through there, you can see a lot of little woody species out there, um, which are slowly mm. going to take over um, because we are getting a little bit drier. Um, and the drier we get, the easier it is for them um, to uh, move in. Uh, Big Glade um, is still very, very wet. Um, and then it also doesn't have anybody going in and out of it. Um, so invasive species aren't being introduced um, and it's not being um, dried out where these other plants can um, take over. Mm. Okay, yeah, there's a, um, there's a little uh, plant that grows all along the boardwalk path that um, is all around the cranberries. And I forget the name of it. Does it start with an R or something like that? Um, are you thinking about the dewberries? It's like a vine. Maybe, maybe so. It's small, but it, it's just uh, all over. And um, I, I wouldn't have known that that was a non-native, uh, an invasive, that uh, if someone hadn't told me that, because it looks like it belongs there, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you'll find it in uh, more places than just the glades as well. Hmm. Uh, the last question I wrote down, because I have trouble remembering if I don't write down, is uh, how did the skunk cabbages produce that heat? I'm not sure of the particular chemicals in the plant, but it's essentially it's a chemical reaction that they do. And they can only do it for that short period of time. So um, it's like a week to two weeks um, that they can even do it. Um, and oh. it will only be in the spring. That's amazing. I'd never heard that before. <laughs> Yeah, I was surprised about just how warm they can actually keep it. I mean, 70 degrees is pretty warm for a little plant when you're got covered in snow. <laughs> well, Rosanna, I'm so appreciative that you did this. Uh, and I hope that uh, all of those folks who are watching the recording or live here today will pay a visit. I definitely am going to make an effort to go at a different time of year than I typically uh, find time to go up there. Um, like in the fall or even the winter, that would be awesome. So thank you so much for sharing all that. Um, uh, folks who are here, uh, we're going to be doing Black Bears with Colin Carpenter, the DNR's uh, Black Bear Program Specialist next Friday. So don't miss it. <laughs> We'd love to have you. And I know that Black Bears are, are active in parts of the state right now. Um, lots of sightings of Black Bear here recently around me. So I uh, hope to see you next week. Have a safe and safe and happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye.